Now, let's get rolling. We begin with three leading oncologists here with dispatches from the front lines. For that, please welcome Michael Calagari, jury, president, and physician-in-chief at City of Hope National Medical Center. Welcome. <laughs> Nancy Davidson, executive director and president of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Welcome. And David. David Tuvison, Director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Cancer Center and Chief Scientist at the Lustgarten Foundation. You have big and wonderful and impressive titles. Sorry for taking so long. Here to lead the conversation is my colleague, the Atlantic Science, Technology, and Health Editor, Ross Anderson. Ross, take it away. All right. Um, good morning. Thank you to everyone for being with us today. Uh, we just heard Margaret tell us that it's been nearly 50 years uh, since President Nixon declared this war on cancer. And uh, not to stretch this metaphor too far, but I feel privileged that we have sort of three of the leading field generals uh, with us today in this war. And so I want to start by getting kind of a big picture sense from you about what's changed across those 50 years. Now, none of you were working in cancer 50 years ago, but give us a sense of just for the scale of the operation of cancer research. How did that look 50 years ago versus now? Well, I could, I could start, Ross. Take it away, Mike. Um, I think what's one of the most important things to remember is that 50 years ago, and even I think 30 years ago, when I was in medical school, somebody had cancer. It was really just the C word, and um, everyone died. And I think today, if you just pause for a moment, in the three short decades, Everyone here knows someone living successfully with cancer or cured of cancer. In fact, there are likely many people in the room. And that, in part, is due to the scaling of the research endeavor, uh, the armamentarium we have uh, to, um, sorry. No, no. Yeah, armamentarium we have to attack the disease. So it's, it's really mind-boggling. That has really been driven by a massive accumulation of researchers, universities, pharmaceutical industries embracing cancer as a mission and you know the results in such a short time have been profound. I, I would add that you know, many lives have been saved if you look at the American Cancer Society statistics and they think mm -hmm. about the number of deaths that have been averted because of the research and care improvements. It's very substantial. Lots of people are alive because of this research today. Um, and I agree with Mike, it could not have been done without a real scale up in research, mm. in team science and in team care. Mm. and all of us being wrapped around the patient. Patients were very silent back yes. in 1971. Yes. Mm -hmm. Patients are at the center right now. Mm. Back in the early 70s, um, I remember hearing about cancer as this disease that was quiet. No one liked to talk about it. Yeah. So if your family member had cancer, it was just a hush conversation. If you remember, back then we had trips to Tijuana, and we had things like interferon, this new medicine that might help in immunotherapy. But we had no knowledge of our enemy. If you want to use the war metaphor, we didn't know the enemy. And if you don't know the enemy, you're scared. Mm. And that's how we were as a community of scientists, of physicians. That has changed dramatically. We now know the enemy. We just now have to defeat it. Mm. And I think during the day, you're all going to hear about these new approaches. As Nancy said, We've saved a lot of people, but we still have so many more to help. And hopefully in our 20 minutes with you, you'll hear how we're <laughs> going to do that. Um, give me a sense for how the funding environment has changed. So like I, when someone has a good idea now uh, about how to treat a, a specific type of cancer, is it hard for that person to get money? Or are there 100 different institutions that are just bearing down their door, throwing millions of dollars at them? It's hard to get the money. Yeah, that's an easy one. Yeah, when I started uh, in, in the mid-80s, uh, about one out of five people at my stage, junior person, thought I had good ideas, had an opportunity to go for federal funding, which is the big source of funding. I was about one in five. And I remember finishing in about the 17th percentile, which is in that range, and getting funded. And my career was off and running. Today, it's one in 10. And had I gotten that score today, I would have never been funded, and my career would have been a dead end. So it's very unfortunate that at a time, as David said, we're really intersecting science, and Nancy said clinical medicine, where we really do know the enemy. Um, we've seen really a diminution in the federal funding, and I think it takes all of us to get together with our 
legislative leaders and get that changed because no money, no mission. Is that, if I could ask you as a follow-up to that, is that, do you feel that that one in, ta one in 10 statistic reflects a kind of good meritocratic filter or are there really nine good ideas that are being, you know, left by the wayside every time that happens? Well, there may not be nine, but there are certainly a considerable number of good ideas that are left by the wayside. Yeah. And you know, the amount of energy that's wrapped into writing these grants perpetually um, mm -hmm. would be better spent on other things. Yeah. I, I, th I think we're really grateful in the last couple of years that there actually has been bipartisan support for the NIH budget. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've seen an increase in funding uh, which comes, of course, after a pretty big drought in previous years. So this is a really important time. There's been bipartisan support for this. This is extremely important investment. But even with this investment, as Mike just said, we're talking about one in 10 grants. I think we're also very reliant on our uh, philanthropic partners. Um, and we mm -hmm. thank them so much for some of the work that they do to try to fill in the gaps. The Lust Garden Foundation, like you work with, the Breast Cancer Research mm -hmm. Foundation I work with. Um, these are groups that help with some of those high risk high impact early phase ideas and get them to the point where we can either fish or cut bait and take them to the NIH. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of parts of this funding puzzle that are so important for us to be able to bring together effectively. Mm. Uh, funding is necessary to um, sustain the enthusiasm of new researchers. Um, they are the most creative, which also means their ideas are the most risky. And as, as Michael was saying, most of them don't get funded because your grant has to be better than the top 10 percentile to get funded. Um, and as Nancy said, there are other methods we use to support such young scientists. Uh, foundation support is one. Uh, philanthropy support is, is, is another. Um, states have taken it on themselves also. New, uh, Texas has their own mm. internal cancer uh, grant funding mechanism, and I think California is thinking about it as well. Perhaps New York could do that. Um, we need to sustain the best minds working on cancer. Uh, and our government is actually quite supportive of it. Ned Sharpless, the NCI director, is working hard to try to increase the number of R01s. That's the uh, main grant used to run laboratories for basic scientists as well as translational scientists. And um, our partners in pharma, um, they realize that the best talent in academia needs to be supported so that their ideas can have an impact in the clinic. And our ideas get turned into, um, sometimes into patents that are then acquired by the private sector that become therapies. Mm. And uh, so we, we do need to think about this practically. In America, we try to support everybody. In other countries, they don't. They use a pyramid structure. Um, so we need to think hard about how to do this, um, but it's very pertinent. I'm glad you brought up the private sector. Uh, the New York Times and ProPublica have done some recent reporting on some researchers, uh, fairly senior researchers, at Memorial Sloan Kettering who did not uh, properly disclose uh, uh, certain financial relationships that they had with healthcare companies uh, in the course of their research. I wanted to ask you as you all being on sort of the front line of this field, do you think that's indicative of a larger transparency problem or is this kind of a one-off? So I'll go first on this one, if you don't mind. Please. Um, Memorial Sloan Kettering is a terrific cancer hospital. They sure. take great care of millions of people over their, over their span of being a cancer hospital. As I said before, the job of scientists and physicians fighting cancer is to use anything at their disposal to win. And so that means we have to have great ideas that we can test. So we test it first in the laboratory, and if it looks promising, we try to stimulate a clinical trial. And if we can stimulate a clinical trial and that looks promising, well, that then should become a therapy that helps people everywhere. Mm. For that to take place, in general, you need a corporate sponsor to, to take on your asset, to license it, et cetera. And so the connection between academia and the private sector is, in fact, relevant and necessary. Now, your point, though, is the controversy that came up in the, in the New York Times, is that indicative of something you know, wrong with the academic process or wrong with ac academic medicine or cancer research in general? I, I don't think so. Hmm. I think all of us would agree that we need to be very transparent about what our relationships are with commercial entities because we want to do what's best for patients and not what's best for ourselves. 
that's, you know, I think we all agree to that, like we all agree to the Hippocratic Oath. Um, there probably does need to be standardization of how we do so. Uh, the government gets our IRS form, maybe we should have a conflict IRS form. So everyone, it's just clear what we're doing and there's never ambiguity. So I, I actually don't think there's a massive problem out there and I think we are all committed to making sure that patients realize that, you know, we're only doing this because we're trying to put ourselves out of work, not because we're trying to put ourselves in business. Hmm. But I, perhaps yeah. my, my views are... I agree with more... David completely. I, I would say that all of us who read the New York Times, of course, thought pretty hard about what's going on in our own centers. Sure. And I don't see this as a pervasive problem mm -hmm. um, in any way, shape, or form. I think it does call us out to do a couple of things that you mentioned, David. One is that we don't really have, surprisingly, really uniform standards about how this should be done, and we need to do this as a field. There's some ambiguity about um, what would be appropriate, and I think all of us would say that the most appropriate thing would be very, very disclosing about everything that you're doing, and then let those who are looking at the work decide how they feel about it. So full disclosure is the coin of the realm. The second part with which I completely agree is that, you know, we are nowhere without our pharma partners. Mm. We can have every good idea in the world, but if we want to actually take it that last mile to the patient, we must have our pharma colleagues, and so we have to be working very closely with them in a very transparent way to make these advances have an impact on people's lives. Mm. Um, We've mostly been talking about sort of the structure and funding of cancer research so far, and I want to pivot to the actual science of it. Uh, and let's talk first about immunotherapy because uh, it's, it's kind of the thing that we're hearing about most, most recently. The Nobel Prize was awarded to Jim Allison, and I think the, the Nobel Committee said something to the effect that he had established an entirely new principle um, in the treatment of cancer. And I want to ask you three, how, how revolutionary is this set of treatments? It's big. Yeah. It's very, very big. I mean, uh, we're really, for the first time, arming our own body to treat our own cancers. Um, we've discovered that one of the ways that cancer is able to spread and able to grow is it, it releases a kind of anesthesia. It puts our own immune system to sleep. Mm. And as a consequence of that, the enemy can walk right through. Um, what this new treatment has done is it's really woken up the immune system where it can recognize in some instances, not all instances, um, that there's an enemy amongst us. It can actually see the tumor cell that put it to sleep. So we're reversing that, that anesthesia on the tumor cell. And, uh, and it's attacking it in many instances, it's winning. So I call this the, the, the fifth dimension of cancer care because for 200 years we had surgery and 100 years we've had radiation and about 50, 60 years chemotherapy. Then we have targeted therapies due to precision medicine and now immune therapy. And we're in its infancy just as we were with chemotherapy 60 years ago. And we will march along and I think you'll see it moving closer and closer to the, the beginning of treatment and ultimately will prove to be cost effective as well. It is big. We, we do have those five pillars of cancer therapy, and I think it's so exciting that we have a brand new one to bring to bear here. And, and it's wonderful of us because, of course, this is not a completely new concept. The notion of immune therapy for cancer is an old one. It's decades old. Absolutely. What's exciting is that because of scientific insights, we now understand some of these breaks that you're talking about, some of these, you know, the sort of invisibility cloak that cancers put over themselves, and we can begin to think about how we can rip that cloak off and allow those cancers to be susceptible. And for me, it's exciting because you can think about how you can take this newest modality and use it effectively with our pre-existing modalities. Um, so anytime we have more options, this is a good thing for patients. And it's thanks to phenomenal basic science from people like Jim Allison. David, let me ask you, uh, just as a follow-up to that, do we have a sense uh, for which cancers are uh, most easily treated by immunotherapy treatments now and which are the most elusive? Like what's been the most successful and what seems really difficult at this point? Well, I, I mean, as, as Nancy and Michael said, immunotherapy uh, that you hear about recently with Jim Allison's work and Hanjo's work, it, it's been around for a while just in different forms. We had bone marrow transplant invented at the Hutch some 50, 60 years ago and that was probably the first form of real immune therapy. Um, and 
the, the antibodies which uh, Jim and uh, Dr. Hanjo invented were ones that reactivate the immune system, as, as Michael said, and they work well on cancers where you have a lot of mutations. So melanoma that you get on the sun-exposed part, parts of your body, lung cancer, or individuals who have a tobacco uh, history. These are the ones that are, appear to be the most sensitive. The cancers where you have lots of mutations. The immune system sees mutant proteins as foreign antigens like it would see an infection. But, but the real challenge is how do we take all forms of cancer and make them susceptible to immune therapy? Um, many cancers don't work, these, mm -hmm. these medicines, and uh, part of the basic science done at all of our institutes is to identify the mechanism that allows evasion of the immune system, correct that, and then get the body's natural immune system to fight the cancer. So, you know, pancreas cancer, classic example. And so that's what we are doing, and I would say um, at their sites, Michael and um, uh, Nancy are doing the same. Mike, I know at, at uh, City of Hope that you all are thinking uh, in great detail about patient experience. That's a big part of what you do, and I know it's a big part of what you all do, too. Um, how has that changed in recent decades? And uh, have the patients themselves changed? Like, are people coming in much more informed now because of you know, the internet and everything they can learn on there? And, or does that present some challenges for you all? Great question. I think uh, there's a newness to it, but at least at City of Hope, on literally our golden gate as you walk through, our motto has been for our over 100 years, uh, there is no profit in curing the body if in the process you destroy the soul. Mm. So patient experience has been at the center of what City of Hope does. We actually have one of the largest supportive care departments, over 100 members, that literally provides the support to patients, psychosocial, physical, pain control, uh, as they go through their therapy. Certainly patients are coming in much more informed, uh, much more passionate about getting therapy than, as was said earlier, the silence, the fear, the unknown, with the internet, with these types of forum, people are getting more and more educated and want to look for a treatment that will sustain their life, that will cure their cancer. So, um, but, you know, as a consequence of um, curing other diseases, a lot of patients waiting. And so at City of Hope, we have a consciousness about patients waiting to be treated, waiting to find a doctor, waiting to get an appointment, waiting for a cure. So all the way from our researchers to our surgeons to our medical oncologists and our supportive care colleagues, there's a sense of waiting and, and, and uh, meeting that challenge to make sure that people you know, get what they need as soon as they, they hear those three words, you have cancer. You know, I think that goes back to the question you asked at the beginning about what's changed since 1971. I think that everybody knows that many patients with cancer get their treatment and get on with their lives and do just fine. Um, and so I think that's a really important concept for, for patients when they learn about their diagnosis. They realize that there are many options out there, that some of them may well be useful for them, and they can take advantage of those things and be able to move on with full lives afterwards. It's allowed us to create you know, a whole new science for us, which has to do with cancer survivorship. Mm -hmm. What do you do after you get that treatment for early breast cancer and you've got a life expectancy of 40 years ahead of you? How is that going to have an effect on you? So to me, this is a really exciting time because we can look at that whole continuum from prevention all the way through to survivorship. Um, and patients are at the center of this and they are taking charge. They are working in partnership with their health care team in a very, very productive and healthy way. So I'm the director of a basic science cancer center. I, I did train as a medical oncologist and I, I do uh, talk to patients, but I don't see them every day, but I hear from them every day. And they come to me with these stories about a patient who was cured with immune checkpoint blockade or a targeted therapy. And the Lazarus effect that is now happening more frequently has had a huge impact upon society. People are hopeful now. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they would like to see that for themselves or their family member or the disease that they are um, uh, advocating for. Um, society uh, expects us to win this war that uh, President Nixon started. And I think we have a shot at that if we're, again, given the resources and the time to logically plan for early cures and long-term support of patients. 
Um, you know, so the immune checkpoint blockade uh, antibodies are, are really great for certain patients. Um, we're not able to test them on many other patients uh, due to the financial situation behind using them. Uh, we know now that when we treat a patient, we want to look in their tumor in the beginning while we're treating them and while they're doing well or not so well to figure out why. But to sequence the genes in their tumor or look at the cells in their tumor is fairly expensive. And a lot of times we can't find the resources to even take the best care of our patient. It's like saying, take care of a heart patient, you just can't use your stethoscope. Hmm. Like, who would do that? And so we need, we need to be able to use the tools that we're developing, I think, to actually figure out how to take best care of patients. And on the science side, we're inventing the next stethoscope. We would like to give the stethoscope to Nancy and Michael so they can use it. And so we need a structure for doing so, so that when patients come to us, we can say, we will take care of you, we will not fail you, we will not stop. I want to give this uh, learned audience a chance to, to ask some questions, but before I do that, Nancy, could you tell me just from, you, your perch gives you quite a bird's eye view of the field, and so would you let us know, apart from immunotherapy, which tends to take up a lot of the oxygen in the public conversation right now, what are you seeing coming out of clinical trials that's really exciting? Well, I am excited about immunotherapy, and that's writ large, not only the checkpoint inhibitors that we've been talking about, but the whole area of CAR T cells, you know, being able to engineer our own immune cells to recognize and destroy tumors, um, something that's going on at Fred Hutch and other places, so we're extremely excited about that. And I remain very excited about targeted therapy. You know, I'm a breast cancer person, Ross, and we've been practicing targeted therapy for decades mm -hmm. with anti-estrogen types of therapies. And now we can take that kind of scientific insight and apply it to so many pathways mm -hmm. that are important in cancer cell growth uh, across so many cancer types. And so I see this wedding of immunotherapy, targeted therapy um, as something that's going to be extremely important for us going forward. Mm. All right, questions? My name is Valerie Bowling. I'm with IO360. And my conference, uh, my question for you is, um, can you share your thoughts on the future of integrating clinical care and clinical research? So some cancer centers are really great at this and others, not everybody gets the option to have a clinical trial. Yes. I think um, it's very, very important because as soon as we have more patients on clinical trials, the quicker we get to the answer. Every time a patient is treated with standard therapy, the field stands still. We don't learn anything. So access to clinical trials is critically important. The National Cancer Institute has set up um, NCI, Designated Comprehensive Cancer Centers. Uh, David's at a cancer center. We're both at comprehensive cancer centers. And within those centers, you've got about a four or five-fold higher number of trials and number of patients going on trials. It's been more of a challenge to bring those trials to the community where many, many patients are treated because of the unknown, the safety, possible toxicity from those trials, mm -hmm. and community colleagues not being fully staffed to handle many of the more experimental therapies. So I think it's important when you're considering, when you hear the three words, you have cancer, always think of a clinical trial it's for yourself and it's for mankind to move the field forward and consider a second opinion at a comprehensive cancer center where you can learn about that, possibly take it back to the community or receive such a therapy at a, at a comprehensive cancer center. There's about 50 in the country. You know, I couldn't agree with Mike more. I, I tell patients that, you know, for me, clinical research is clinical care. I think these things are so tightly integrated that it's really hard for us to separate them. And I personally believe that a appropriate clinical trial is a standard of care for any patient where such a trial can be identified. And I tell my patients that, you know, today's <laughs> therapy is because of yesterday's trials. And tomorrow's therapy is going to be because of today's trials. And though we're celebrating a lot of success we've had since 1971, we are not done, as David said at the outset. So we need those trials in order to push our field forward and to help people everywhere. Hello, um, my name is Helen Schiff, and I'm from SHARE, a breast cancer group in New York City, and also at the National Breast Cancer Coalition. And I just wanted to mention that I think advocates have played a key role, and it hasn't been mentioned here, in getting money. The Department of Defense program uh, is something that the National Breast Cancer Coalition got, and we played a key role in getting Herceptin 
the drug that was mentioned uh, that, played a, that plays a key role in really helping very bad breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer. We played a key role in that. And the establishment was not really very supportive in the beginning of Herceptin. And I just want to mention that we are having a meeting uh, share on January 10th with Charles Ornstein mm. from, the, from ProPublica about the conflict of interest at Sloan Kettering. Right. And if people want a leaflet and want to come, right. I have it. I, I, uh, as somebody who works in the breast cancer field, I, I feel a little remiss that we didn't talk about how important advocacy is because I couldn't agree with you more. I think that you know, so much of what we've accomplished across oncology it's because advocates have come to bear, um, both to help us to inform our research, to help us with our fundraising, to basically promote advocacy and to provide support for the many people who have been diagnosed with cancer over the years. So let's not minimize that for a second. I think that's one of the reasons actually why research in this country has been so phenomenal is because we've had such a wonderful team wrapped around it with our advocates and our scientists and our clinicians. Advocates got President Nixon to sign the Cancer Act. They sure did, Mary Lasker. Advocates, uh, patient advocates coming to Congress <laughs> with a story, change policy. Policy is everything. So to your point, thank you. And the advocates are what have changed certain cancers such that the standard of care is a clinical trial, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it has been for pediatric cancer. Yep. For pancreas cancer, that is the standard of care when someone asks me because of advocacy groups. Mike, Nancy, David, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>